How many of you remember where you were a year ago today? Do you? Where were you, Todd? At the men's retreat. Thank you very much. On my phone this morning, uh, Facebook reminded me of the snow that landed on us a year ago. Right? And some of us were looking around like, are we going to get snowed in? A year later, I think, some of us might think that might have been the best thing that could have happened. Because the next day, the governor decided to snow us in in a different way. And I'm not making light of that, because a year has gone by and a lot has happened. A lot. Uh, both with the COVID and people who have had to deal with it personally, the families that have been affected by it, um, those who work in the healthcare field who have had to take up a mighty cross and really press in. Um, but yet, in spite of all that going on, life has also gone on for many of us. You know, in our family, we've had a death and we've had a birth. Uh, we celebrated a graduation uh, of a couple of loved ones from college educations. We had very positive things and we've had some negative things. And so many families in our church the same way. I want to just stop right now and pray a little bit of that. Let's give thanks to God for, for some of the things that have gone on and where he's been with us. Heavenly Father, this year, none of us could have imagined. And looking back, we see with some perspective that perhaps uh, we needed you. <laughs> well, Lord, we did, and we do. And we give thanks for the times you carried us through. We ask, God, for your mercy and your grace to pour out even more on those who still have sorrow, still have regrets, still have suffered loss. And yet, uh, Lord, we know you have never left us. You've never wavered. You were with our loved ones in their times of trial, and you're with us now. And Lord, in our times of rejoicing, you were there too, and you were the one who carried us into those moments. And so we give thanks. We, we rise up and we sing our praises because you are good. So Lord, give us perspective that you have so that even as we stand here today, we can't see what a year from now looks like, but we can see you're there. And so we give thanks for that. We thank you, God, with all of our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's more than one side to the story. And sometimes a different perspective can help you understand things better. There's more than one side to the story. Today's scripture is, uh, that we're studying as we're continuing our study in John is from the 12th chapter. So if you want to pull your Bibles out, we'll read the first 11 verses of John 12. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs or there will be up on the screen for you there. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, he said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So let me set the scene for you here, this, this episode that we see. And what I want to try to do for you this morning also is to have you take this episode and consider it within a much larger context of what has happened, what is happening, and what's about to happen. A year ago, on in February, we wouldn't have imagined what happened in March, and the same thing for April, and the same thing for May, and the same thing for June. And each one of those is almost like a puzzle. As we can see it now, it's come together. But then all we saw was a nebulous future. But let me set the scene for you in terms of an introduction. There were many other similar gatherings. Jesus, 
did not have his own home base. It wasn't unusual for Jesus to eat in someone else's house. That was common. There were many times that, and it also was not unusual for Jesus to be anointed. I'm going to tell you more about that later. This was not the only anointing story. I've asked a couple of my friends, uh, how many times was Jesus anointed? And it's always a question. One, two, one, two, one, two. We'll get to that. It's not as uncommon as you think. It happened more than, okay. Um, it's also, again, easy to disconnect this scene from all the others. In fact, it's really easy to kind of pass over this one because the things that are happening next, it gets more and more and more exciting. And so we kind of want to, we went from Lazarus got raised from the dead. And then dinner. Jesus is going to ride a donkey. And so we kind of skip this one. But this one's really important. The times they were living in were very risky. There was a lot of tension and a lot of stress and a lot of fear and higher taxes and wars and threats of wars and governments and it was not a very good time to be alive. It was a challenging time for them, just as maybe now we see the same. Lazarus was raised from the dead probably about three weeks prior to this. After the story where Lazarus was raised and it became known, they, they started to plot after Jesus, and so he left. Because of him raising Lazarus, they plotted openly to get Jesus, and so he had to withdraw. But now he comes to Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem, but to a safe place because it's Martha, Mary, and Lazarus' home, his friends. Let me tell you what, if you want to study people in the Bible and try to be like one of them, these are three people to look at, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They're amazing people. There's not much about them. Read it and meditate on it and see how strong their faith is. See how much they desire Jesus. That's a great example for us all. So the Pharisees were plotting against Jesus. Many people, it says in the scripture, were coming to Jerusalem to prepare themselves for the Passover. It was a big feast. Think of how we treat Christmas culturally and how we start planning for it. And, and even now, what we say is, can you believe it? I was in Lowe's on the day after Labor Day and Christmas was already happening. That's what we say now. But even when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, the month of December, Thanksgiving came and then Christmas started, right? Still, we had a cultural experience of let's build up to this big event well, if you really read the Christmas story, and don't get me started, but if you really read the Christmas story, it starts on Christmas and goes. It doesn't end on Christmas. Well, Passover for them had become just like our Christmas. Let's get ready. Let's get, every, let's get the house cleaned. Let's get to Jerusalem and get purified. Let's get ourselves ready. Get everything we need in order to accomplish the cultural. And oh, by the way, we'll have, we'll go, we'll have a church service too. We'll have a Passover thing and have that Seder dinner, which is mom and sis. Dad likes it. The kids think it's weird. We'll do that, right? And we'll make the youngest one read, even though maybe he doesn't understand what he's saying. That's what was happening. So they were doing their cultural things, but yet there was all this hubbub going on because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. It wasn't the first person he raised from the dead, by the way. That had also happened before. But this one was witnessed by a lot of people. And they told a lot of people. And they told a lot of people. So people who were coming were wondering, are we going to see Jesus? But Jesus had withdrawn. We saw that in chapter 11. Six days before the Passover then is when this setting is. Six days before he comes to Bethany, Lazarus is there and they give him a dinner. Here's a few of the other dinners that Jesus was at. He went to Zacchaeus' house. He invited himself there. <laughs> what if you met him on the street and he says, I know you're not in really good shape, but I'm coming to your house for dinner. But he did that. He went to Matthew or Levi's house and had dinner with all the tax collectors. Uh, he, he had dinner with sinners quite often. He, he, uh, Peter's mother-in-law got healed. And as soon as she got healed and got, rose up from her sick bed, she served dinner. That's how well he healed Peter's mother-in-law, or, or maybe how strongly. But that seems to me when I read that story, it's a place that Jesus often went. He was, he was accustomed to being there, and she was accustomed to serving. Um, three Simons had him over for dinner. Simon was actually a fairly popular name. Peter's name was Simon. Uh, so Simon, Peter's mother, mother-in-law. Simon the Pharisee had him for dinner. Uh, and Simon the leper, not the same guy, by the way. If you read the Bible, two different. 
It's unlikely that a Pharisee would be a leper. Very unlikely. So those are different guys. Martha and Mary, you know that story with Martha and Mary, right? They had them over, and Martha's cooking and doing the whole thing, like, like Peter's mother-in-law, right? And then Mary, and you know that whole story, okay. And the Last Supper, we remember that supper. So, Well, a significant part of this episode is when Mary anoints the feet of Jesus, and we're going to talk about anointings uh, in a little bit. But it's important for us to remember that upon greeting someone in their home in that time, culturally, it was really common to offer a bowl of water. And if you had the means to, have a servant actually help to bathe the feet of the person who was being received. And so there was a cleaning. The grime and the gunk and the junk and the garbage of the world were being washed away from their feet. And they would either drop a little drop of perfume into the oil, into the water, or they would take a little dab of ointment and anoint the head. And that would give off a sweet perfume. They, they'd use a, they'd have maybe a bottle like this. We use that when we anoint people for prayer. And they'd take a little dab. And then we'd give a little sweet perfume so that we could stand to sit next to each other when we're having dinner. Basically, the grime and the gunk of this world had to get washed off. We had to be made comfortable and relaxed. And it would be a little bit of a fragrance that would make it so that we could stomach our lunch that was coming. That, that's what was happening. That was the common way of greeting people. But we see in this story Mary anointing the feet. And I don't want you to misunderstand. She wasn't cleaning his feet at the door. It's different than that. It's very different than that. So now that the scene is set, I want to tell you something. There's more than one side to the story. And sometimes getting a different perspective can help us understand better. There's more than one side. So let's take a look at some of the sides of the story. Let's take a look first through the eyes of Lazarus. Lazarus. What can we say about Lazarus? There's one three-word sentence I can tell you about Lazarus. He is alive. Right? He was dead. He's alive. What, I think that's enough on that. He was a longtime friend of Jesus. Longtime friend. Jesus loved him. He was raised from the dead. And here he is walking, talking, laughing, smiling, hugging. All those things we don't get to do in COVID, he was doing, right? He feared death no more. He's alive. And not only that, there was a lot of people that saw him before he was dead, while well, didn't see him necessarily while he was dead, but knew he was in there dead and saw him come out. A lot of witnesses. Je Lazarus is proof that Jesus is for real. He's proof of it. And, by, and because of that, he's dangerous. Lazarus is dangerous. In fact, we saw that at the end of the verses we read today is that the plot now had to be hatched to get rid of Lazarus. He's almost as dangerous, if not more so, than Jesus. Why? He's got a story. He's blinking and breathing, and no one can deny it. I had a friend. I mean, Terry and I have had an experience with a friend probably about seven years ago, a woman we went to church with. She was in her late 30s. Very fit, very put together, um, you know, ran exercise classes, et cetera, et cetera. Her name is Bonnie. She had a stroke. That's a very young age to have a stroke. And at the hospital, the doctor said, where the stroke is located and the severity of the stroke, the fact that you're now experiencing total blindness, that's probably going to stay like that forever. And the fact that you're having a little bit of slurred speech, that's probably going to get worse. And the fact that you're having a hard time walking and you don't have any balance, that's also probably going to get worse. It was a very, very bad outlook for her. Well, she's a woman of prayer. We were a church of prayer. We went to prayer. It was not at this church. We're a church of prayer here too, but we, were, we went to prayer. Six days later, she walked out of the hospital. Completely healed. I want to tell you, the next week in church, wit was pretty full. <laughs> And I didn't, it, I wanted to get close because I knew Bonnie. She was part of the worship team. We were part of the worship team. And if, I didn't have to, though. I just needed to see her come through the door. I saw the miracle. Oh, to be a witness to that. I knew her before. To hear this news is so crestfallen. To see her risen and alive. 
She blinked and breathed on us, and she testified the goodness of God, and that's Lazarus. Now, i got to ask you a question. You're blinking and breathing today, right? right? Everybody's pretty much taking nourishment, you know, right? Showering once in a while, you know. We're living life, right? How are the compassion and power of God clearly displayed in your life? This is the challenge of Lazarus. And this is the perspective. If you can see this scene through the eyes of Lazarus, he has one purpose in life now, and that is to make sure that people know Jesus is for real. I'm alive because of it. And I know your story, some of them. And you know, some of you know some of my story. And I'm only standing here because of Jesus. Some of you have come out of some really difficult, challenging things, and you might even say yourself, I was a whole dead person. I just hadn't passed away yet. But I was dead in all of that, all of that garbage of my life. I was dead in all of that. That had consumed me. Maybe some of you are struggling with that now today. What's consuming your life now? That if only you could just get Jesus to resurrect you from that. Well, Lazarus gives us that perspective. You know, bon if you saw Bonnie on the street right now, you would not know. She has to tell her story. But those who saw it, like me, we tell her story. And it gave you a little bit of faith this morning didn't it? It perked you up. It's like, ooh, wow. Wait, what? She walked out. Her yes. We have to have, be able to tell our before and after. You can't live in the shame of what was before because it's that death and the resurrection that gives glory to God. You cannot hide the shame of what was. You have to tell the story. Lazarus is blinking and breathing, and guess what? There's a plot for his life, and he is still out there. Life could get dangerous for us. I just wonder, do you feel like you might be dangerous to anybody? Are you rattling anybody's cage? Are you threatening their understanding of what reality is all about by the way you live your life, by the story that you tell? We should be. That's, that's what the call is on our lives. That's what we should be. You know, there's more than one side to the story, though. And sometimes a different perspective can help you understand it better. So let's talk about Mary. Mary's pretty central to this story. She has anointed the feet of Jesus with the, with the oil, an expensive oil, nard, N-A-R-D, um, and lots of it, by the way. You know, it wasn't a little anointing like a dab like we do with this. This is how much oil it was. I know, right? This is a pint. This is what the estimate is. This is how much oil. So to take a bath, to have a foot bath, I mean, that's enough to really, and so imagine the fragrance from that. Because it says in the scriptures, the fragrance filled the whole house. It filled the house. It was not just, I can stand to sit next to this guy and he can stand to sit next to me. It was the fragrance that was poured over Christ fills the house. Anybody that came late, they got drawn into that. They didn't need to be dabbed. Anybody walking down the street with the windows open, what's going on in there? Simon's throwing a party and didn't invite me? What's going on? Let's check it out. The fragrance of Christ just filled, filled all. That's a lot of oil, right? Now you're all wondering, am I going to open that and drink that, aren't you? It's like, not really. I could do it. Anyway, very expensive. And it was estimated that, that the 300 denarii would have been a year's wages. One year's wages. This is probably the most precious thing, the most valuable thing that Mary and their family had. She probably didn't own it alone. It was probably, and it could have even been held in community. Sometimes those things weren't just held in families. We're so used to like our automatic garage door opener kind of lives right now that everything we have is just mine. Instead of thinking, in my neighborhood, there's a lawnmower and a weed whacker and a rake, and we all just use those things together. And they would have burial preparation oil would have been somewhat the same. So she had somehow gotten her hands on the thing that was most valuable and precious and was pouring it out. And you heard Judas, and we'll talk about him in a minute. She took what would have cost a year's worth of wages. Like, don't eat for a year to get the thing that you need to get in order for someone to be properly buried. And that, that's what she was using. That's what she gave away. This was, as I said, an extra event. This was not 
simply washing Jesus' feet so he could come in from outdoors where his feet were all grimy and he could sit at the table. She was anointing him for the future. And he said that to us. And we'll see that scripture in a minute. She said, he's, she, he's, she's preparing me for my burial. She's, she's looking ahead to the future. This was not the first time, actually, that Mary uh, was at the feet of Jesus. And I want to point that out, too. There's a lot of repetition here. More than one time he had dinner at someone's house. More than one time he's anointed. More than one time Mary spent time at the feet of Jesus. So let's take a look at some of those scriptures. The first one is Luke 10, verses 38 and 39. This is at the, the uh, beginning of the story of Martha and Mary. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister, Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So we just stop there in the story and don't get into the other part where it's like who was right and who was wrong and what are we supposed to do about that? Because some of us feel more like Martha's than Mary's and we wonder what we did wrong. Just, just don't go there. Just look at the fact that Mary wanted to learn. And learning from Jesus takes focus. And that's the message Jesus was trying to give to Martha. He never questioned Martha's faith. In fact, in, in John 11, it was Martha's faith, Martha's strong belief that said, I know if you had been here, Lazarus would have lived. That was Martha's faith. This was Martha bringing Jesus into her home to feed him and care for him. But it was Mary who Jesus said, she's focused. She's learning. So at his feet, if you want to learn from Jesus and about Jesus, you've got to get close to Jesus. You've got to get focused on Jesus. Don't just take it from me or the pastor. Get a hold of his word. Get close to Jesus and learn. That's the first time. The second time was in the 11th chapter. Right after, 11th chapter of John. Go there, John eleven thirty two. 32. Right after Martha had said, it, I believe, and if only you had been here. When we get to verse 32, it says, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So Mary, in expressing her complete faith and her hope and her belief that Christ has the power and the willingness, she throws herself at his feet. She's humbling herself right at his feet. That's what faith really looks like. We stand and pray in your mind, in your heart. It should be, I'm humbling myself at your feet. Lord. I need you, and I know that you can do this, expressing my faith. And then, and then the third verse, um, John 12, 3, from today's passage, it says, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This is honoring Jesus through fealty. I know this is an unusual word, perhaps. Fealty. F-E-A-L-T-Y. If you know your uh, ancient English language at all, the Middle Ages, and the, the, the Lord of the lands, and then he had people, the, the, the common people, and they had fealty toward him. If you're a Marine, you know what fidelity is. It's a, it's a complete dedication to duty. Fealty is a, the same way, a complete dedication to the Lord. So I chose this word not so much because, well, although it does, it fits with the Fs, three Fs, alliterative. Good pastor trick, right? But really the significance of fealty is complete devotion and dedication to the Lord. And by the way, in those medieval times, it wasn't all bad. It was mutual. The Lord protected them. The Lord provided for them. They were in it together. They needed each other. And so there was an exclusive and mutual arrangement. We will be dedicated one to each other. And just like God sending his son is completely dedicated to you, he's asking you, will you be completely dedicated to him? Completely. Now, I want to challenge you on this. I challenge myself on this. The first two are easy. I mean, you have to decide. So they're not easy in that they just happen naturally. But the last one's really hard. Just like I challenge you with Lazarus, is, is the, your testimony on display? Would people know about God's compassion and power? I challenge you with this one. Are you completely 
devoted. She took the most expensive thing she had. And she wasn't, she wasn't dabbing it. She was pouring it out. Just, here it is. It's all, this is what you need. It's all you need. I give you everything I have to you. There's more than one side to the story. And sometimes getting a different perspective can help you understand better. So let's take a look at Judas. Judas is often one of the most skipped over and, and ignored uh, people that we have in the Bible. And that's really not for our benefit. We shouldn't do that. There's not a mistake. God didn't put some people in here by accident for us to ignore them. Judas is extremely significant to our walk in this life today. He's extremely significant for us to understand Judas. Not to be like him. We see him as a selfish betrayer, and he's painted this way also. John writes his gospel very parenthetically, by the way. It's really easy to see him sneak in these things. Like, he'll introduce Mary way back in an earlier chapter, and he'll, he'll, he'll give a little... Uh, um, to give a little uh, spoiler alert, right? She's the one who anoints the feet. But that's like three chapters ago, right? What do you mean anoints the feet? When's the, you know, you didn't get there yet. And then here's, so here's Judas, like, he's the one who's going to, he's going to betray Jesus. If you're the, if this is the first time you ever read John, think about it. We, we got it all. We have all the story kind of put into chronological order. If you said to a friend who's a non-Christian, never read the Bible, read John, it'll make everything clear. He's going to betray him. She, I mean, I didn't see that part. So John writes that way. And that's, that's a form of writing that was true in those days. Historically, it was like they just wanted to connect all the dots. But here's Judas. He's selfish and he's a betrayer. But you know what else he is? He was called. He was made an apostle. He must have been confident. Otherwise, they wouldn't have him counting the dough. Somebody had to do that, and that's not easy for everybody to keep track of all that. He's also raising a very good point. We should be taking care of the poor. Jesus told us to do that. I imagine this. I imagine you cannot imagine being called by Jesus living with him and learning from him for three years, serving him and serving alongside of him and serving in his direction. The apostles, you know the story in Luke, in Luke 10 when the 70 or 72 are sent out and they go two by two, don't take anything. And if you, you know, don't say hi to anybody when you get there, look for the man of peace and heal people, declare the kingdom of God. You know that story? If you say no, then we'll preach that another time. That's fine. It's a great story. In Mark 6, Jesus sent the apostles out to do the exact same thing. Judas, I don't know who his partner was, but they went out and they healed people in Jesus' name. They, they drove out evil spirits in Jesus' name. This is Judas, right? He wasn't always the guy that betrayed. He, he betrayed him, but up until then, he was just like everybody else. So I can't imagine you're called by Jesus you're living with him, learning from him. You're serving with him, alongside him. You did what he asked you to do, and you went out in his name, and you accomplished great things. And then you came back and betrayed him. I do not imagine any single person in this room would sign up for the betrayal part or could imagine themselves doing the betrayal part. But we have to be careful that in our hearts, we might still be tempted to do those sorts of things. Judas said, his, said what Jesus said in Matthew 25, go serve the poor. When you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So I think the challenge we learn from Judas and the perspective of Judas' story is do our good works for Jesus <clears throat> keep me from relationship with Jesus? That's what was happening in this story. I spent my entire professional life in nonprofit service organizations. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good that I've done that. But without Jesus, what's the point? James tells us that, right? <clears throat> Jesus said to Judas, the poor you're going to always have, but you do not always have me. And so it's important for us to encounter and experience God while we can and whenever we can. 
we, we are stressing with our Reignite this year, experiencing God through reading the Bible and praying. And I would add to that worship and praise. That, that if you don't know how to begin reading the Bible, you don't know how to begin praying, then sing a praise song. Start there. If you're not sure, where, where, what do I read? How do I begin? What do I do? The Psalms and the Proverbs are a great place to start. Just pick one. If you're not sure which one, look at the calendar and pick the one that has the same number as the date. I know I'm making this overly simple, but sometimes you have to remind yourself. If you're still not sure, we, the pastors, we're reading a lot in the book of John right now. Have you noticed? <laughs> so read last week's chapter and this week's chapter and next week's chapter. And then when you come in and hear the preaching, it'll be much more deep. It'll be much more meaningful because you already have your own questions and your own thoughts. God will be speaking to you. Read the Bible. Take it in in small bites and chew it and digest it. And it's better, it's better to get the Bible in you than you through the Bible. There's not a race. It's way better if you get one verse and you really own it than it is for you to say, I read the whole Bible and I got done in six months. Beat you. Ha. James, James says that faith without works is dead. Jesus is essentially saying here, works in my name without faith. Well, so listen to what he says in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? Does this sound like Mark 6? We did all this in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus says, you're always going to have the poor. There's always going to be work to do. And, there, and I'm going to give you the power to do it. I'm going to send my spirit. He didn't say this yet, but later, I'm going to send my spirit. So you can do the works. But right now, the most important thing is to be in relationship with me. It's so important. But you know, there's more than one side to the story. Have you heard that? It's more than one side of the story. And a different perspective can change your understanding. We have the many home gatherings and the many anointings. And I want to talk about the anointings. And I want to give you a picture of why this anointing fits within a larger picture of anointings. And it would be really well understood to the Jews, even the cultural Jews, who were coming to Jerusalem to prepare for Passover, what was happening in this very moment where we maybe need a little education on this part. John sets the stage for this way back in the first chapter of the book, the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist says, on the day after John the Baptist baptized Jesus, in John 1.29, he says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day after that, the scene repeats itself. And John the Baptist says almost the same words. He says, he looked up as they were walking by and he saw Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So John's message is beginning to change from you need to repent from all that you've been doing wrong to one of, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's message is beginning to change. And he sets the stage. He says it's the Lamb of God. Now why is the Lamb of God an important title or name for Jesus? Do you know that he's called the Lamb of God more than 30 times in the New Testament? A couple times in the Old Testament, actually, but more than 30. Most of them are in Revelation, and most of them happen while they're in heaven worshiping. That in heaven, we're going to worship Jesus as the Lamb of God. He's got all those other titles, but what we're going to call him forever is the Lamb of God. Because he takes away the sin of the world. So look, follow me as I go down through this, what's happening here, and give you the cultural context so that you understand why it was presented this way to them and why we need to grab hold of it. I believe Jesus was anointed four times in the New Testament. A friend of mine who's another pastor said, oh, well, every time you use this kind of, God uses this kind of language, you add to it. I said, okay, we'll get there in a minute. But before we do the four times of Jesus, let me talk to you about how the sacrificial lamb of Passover gets taken care of and gets ready to be that. Because you probably know that, per that lamb's got to be spotless and pure, right? The Passover lamb. But how do they get that lamb that way? So what happens is this. Shepherds 
leading their flocks, find a piece of quiet water, and they take their sheep into the quiet water and across to the other side. And when they do that, it cleans off all of the junk and the gunk that they've been kind of wandering in and laying in and all that kind of stuff. It cleans out some of that. And maybe some of the actual little critters that get in, the bugs and the all that stuff kind of washes off. It also lets the shepherd have a chance to see a little bit more clearly what's going on. Are there any injuries or infections that need to be treated? Because all the lambs, all the sheep need to be kept alive. They all have value. But in the process of doing that, if they find a lamb with no blemish, no infections, no wounds at all, they, they pull them to the side. And they get special treatment. They get extra cleaning. And they get anointed. Their head gets anointed with oil because the oil does a couple things. One is it becomes a preventative measure to preserve that one that's still without blemish. It keeps the bugs away. It also discolors the wool. And so then in a whole flock, it's easy for the shepherd to see which ones are which. And if danger's coming around, bring all of the chosen sheep, chosen lambs, and protect them even more. So they did it by washing in the water. Secondly, thing that happens is when the shepherds, you know, they don't always stay in one pasture. They move from one pasture to another, depending on the season. And when it's a drier season, they move up to the mountains where it's a cooler season and the grass is still okay. Before they make that trip, the special lambs that, that are anointed get their hooves cleaned and uh, preserved even more because they're going to go through this, diff you know, maybe the chiggers and the ticks and all that stuff. So they put it around the, the hooves and the forelegs so they can make this difficult journey to the mountains. That's, that's what the shepherds would do routinely. Now, we get close to Passover, and everybody's coming into Passover, and, and so the, the families or the, these community groups who share the oil, same group, maybe they share, they're going to share a Passover lamb. they got to go find one. So they go to the shepherd and say, give us a Passover lamb. And so they get their Passover lamb that's been preserved, and they bring them into the, oftentimes, right into their home. They don't just bring them home and let them hang out in the backyard because the coyotes can still get them there. So they literally bring them into the home. It happens six days before Passover. That's the traditional time they do that, six days before. That's because God gave the Israelites six days warning. Get your best lamb. And so they do that. And they anoint the lamb. They, they, they go again to the feet. They clean. They make sure. It's the beginning of an examination process that the family has to go through to say, make sure this is truly a spotless lamb. Is this is going to take our sacrifice. That's what Passover is. We put the blood of the lamb over us so that we can be preserved from the times of, of trouble. And so they start, and they do the, the feet again, the hooves and the forelegs again. And then there's a period of examination. And then two days before, after they've been examining this lamb all this time, two days before, they're ready to say, this lamb is ready. This is the one. It's without spot and blemish. And as a pronouncement, they anoint the head. So that's what happens two days before to this Passover lamb. And then on Passover, on that day, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, in the ninth hour, the sacrifice of the lambs begins. And it has to end by sundown. But it begins at 3 o'clock. And those lambs are sacrificed. And that's, that's what happens. That's the process of what happens to a sacrificial Passover lamb. So let's talk about the anointings of Jesus. Jesus was anointed the first time by God, his father. Jesus went down to see John. John was baptizing. John was being asked by all the people, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you, are you Elijah? Who are you? He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. One is coming. One who is among you is coming. Whose sandals I'm not even fit to tie. One is still, still to come. Jesus then comes to be baptized. Listen to what it says in Matthew 3, 13 through 15. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. Jesus knows this is part of a bigger thing and that righteousness requires the Lamb of God to receive this baptism. 
It goes on to say in verses 16 and 17, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Just like the shepherd finding the perfect lamb, Jesus went and was washed. He came up out of that and was anointed by God himself. My, and my pastor friend says, anytime you hear God in the scripture saying, I'm really happy, this is my son, it's the same re-anointing. So you could add to my four anointings today by saying, you know, one, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay. So, number one, God anointed Jesus. And how do I know that for sure? Acts 10, 34 through 38, Peter has been called to the house of Cornelius because there's some questions about what can we eat and can Gentiles receive the, <clears throat> the good news and all that kind of stuff. And so in the midst of that story, Peter opens his mouth, it says in verse 34, and he says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That's some pretty good news right there, right? As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So this is the first anointing of Jesus is God himself anointing his son for the life work that he's about to undertake. Just like the little sheep called forth, this is, this is the one. The second time he gets anointed is by an unnamed woman. It's in Luke 7. It's, this is the story of um, Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus to come to dinner. It's, it's actually kind of in the middle of Jesus' ministry. And, it, and it's, it's, it's one of the few episodes where you get people sort of from the other side, you know, I know, bringing them into personal space. They would try to trap him in public all the time because they wanted all the witnesses to say, this is what we saw. But, but we see this story in Luke 7. So let's read that scripture. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. One, I got a little, a little just side comment about this situation, right? Simon the Pharisee goes on to criticize Jesus in this scripture. Look, he's associating with sinners. I could never figure out why Simon had a problem with that because this woman seemed like she could just come and go in Simon's house anytime she wanted. Come on. Am I right? Like, how does she get in there unless, you know, I mean, maybe she looked familiar to him. I don't know. Not saying, I'm just saying, he's critical, but, you know, and just in the same way, a different perspective maybe gives us a different point of view, even of ourselves. How do we see others, and how do we throw out there, you know, okay, just saying. John the Baptist was still alive during this time, by the way. If you know your Bible chronologically, John the Baptist is still alive. So he didn't die right after the baptism thing, right? He was around a long time. And kept testifying and, and, and speaking of Jesus. Um, Jesus in this story also spoke of the need to repent and to, and to have forgiveness. Um, and so this, this is like the baptism, this is like the anointing when it's time for the lamb to go to the high country. And it's time for Jesus maybe to go on some difficult parts of his journey. That the lower stuff that's been happening has been coming a little easier. But there's starting to be more questions asked about who this is. And it's starting to be challenged. And he's in the house of the Pharisees. You can almost imagine. It's like, let's see if we can really get him into a trap here. What's going on? And start criticizing him. And so his feet are getting anointed because it's starting to go on a little bit harder stuff that's going to happen here. He's going to go up into the high country for some really hard times. So, so uh, Romans 10.15 says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And that's actually a, a, a re-quoting of a scripture from Isaiah. Isaiah 52, 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. 
who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness and publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So here's the, the Lamb of God being anointed to go to the high mountains, the hard travels, but his feet are beautiful. And he's bringing good news. And he's bringing it back. That's the second anointing. The third anointing is in today's scripture. It's Mary. She's at his feet again. And I've already told you, he had his feet washed. He already had been dabbed. Not just dabbed, you know. Just dabbed. <laughs> this is six days before the Passover. They bring the Passover lamb into the house to say, is this the one? Well, we have a lot of evidence to tell us he is because Lazarus is sitting right there with him. So there he is. But now there's coming a period of examination, not just by the people that are there, but the next day, the next day, and you'll read, hear about this in future sermons, right? The next day he rides a donkey. Well, those people that are watching him on the donkey, it's not just because they believe in Jesus. It's their curious looky-loos. Where's Lazarus? Lazarus and Jesus. They're like a duet. Right? It's the triumphal procession. But it's the beginning of examination. I wonder if he'll do it again. Oh, he doesn't look so big. I thought he was going to be a mighty warrior. What are we, what, what's going on? It's all the questions. Four days before, Jesus goes in and cleans the temple. It's not the only time he did that, by the way. There's more than one episode of Jesus going to the temple and saying it should be a house of prayer. But this is one of the times he does it. And then he teaches. And he's not questioned once in the time that he teaches in the temple. It's an examination that he passes 100%. He's being examined. He's being on display for people to see who he is. And then the fourth anointing comes two days before another special dinner at the home of a guy named Simon the leper. Some people would try to tell you that the Mary episode and this episode are the same. And they have a lot of the words in common. They have a, a, a group of people that say, hey, wait, she shouldn't be pouring out that whole big bunch of oil. Same amount of oil, by the way. She shouldn't be pouring that out. We should use it for the poor. But it doesn't say that it's Lazarus. It says some of them, which almost makes me think some of them were kind of like along with Lazarus because, you know, he was one of their pals. Hey, we went out and healed the sick and cast out demons together. I trust what he's got to say. And he's saying we shouldn't waste it. We should serve the poor. And so the next time it happens, come on, woman, what are you doing? But that's what happens in the story. An unknown woman at the home of Simon the leper. And this story, I'm not going to read it to you, but it's found in Mark and Matthew both. She anoints the head of Jesus, not the feet. It's so significant. It can't be just a oops. There's not a wrong word in here. But you see how it parallels with what the shepherd does and what the people do for their own Passover lamb? The lamb of God is ready. He's been prepared. He's been examined. He's been through the wilderness. All those things have occurred, and he's still spotless. He's not been wounded or infected by this world. He is pure, just like the spotless lamb needs to be to be acceptable on Passover. Let us fulfill all righteousness, Jesus said. It was more than just, I mean, what does all righteousness mean just to get baptized? Get baptized. All righteousness takes the whole story. You need all of it to have all righteousness. And so here is Christ fulfilling all righteousness. You know, it's more, there's more than one side of the story. And sometimes a different perspective can change your understanding. So let me, let me, while I'm getting ready to close, let me invite the worship team to come back up and get set up while I give you the finishing here. I think the perspective that's, that I haven't talked with you about yet, the perspective that's really, really significant for this set of circumstances, this episode and the ones that are connected to it, is the cross. That's the perspective that we all need. It's not what's going on for dinner today. And we had dinner last week. It did the same thing. You know, this is just like the last time he healed somebody, except this time he spit on them. That's gross. That's our perspective of whether we would like that or not, whether we would do it that way or not, whether we would serve the poor or anoint Christ. 
That's our perspective. But the perspective of the cross says this is how we fulfill all righteousness. We have to have all of these things have to occur in order for the cross to mean something. If we could just take any old lamb, Jesus might have sent Judas to do it. And we would have been, yeah, get rid of that guy. But how many times would we have qualified to be that guy that Jesus could have sent? He went to the cross. He went for us. That's the only perspective that can make any difference to this story. So when you look back on the events of your own life, and you realize what Christ did and how you tried to make it all work all those years. And then from the perspective of the cross, it suddenly makes sense what Christ did and how you could be free. How, it did, how you couldn't do that a single, one single bit of freedom on your own part. And Christ, because of the cross, did all of it. Am I right? Could I hear a little amen? Is this not true for you? Yes? You have a story, right? You've been raised from that junk yes. because of the cross. Yes, we've been raised. Well, there's another year coming. That's the bad news. <laughs> right? We got to keep going. Anytime you find yourself in an uncertain moment, in confusion, how am I going to pay this bill? What's the government up to now? Just stop listening to that stuff, please. But yes. if, if you can't avoid it, I guess there was something about the Queen of England lately, right? I mean, I'm out of all that. You see, you can't avoid the headlines, but like, when your life is upside down, when your life is uncertain, when you're not sure where you're going to live, how you're going to pay for it, whether someone loves you or not, if you're still dealing with the fact that somebody hurt you, somebody lied to you, somebody stole from you, or you're the person who did the lying and the hurting and the stealing. If you're still living with that, get the perspective of the cross. That's the only perspective. That's what makes this whole thing make sense. If you're not sure, what do I do now? Just this moment, what do I do now? Go to the cross. Go to the foot of Jesus. Trust him. Learn from him. It's the only perspective that matters. One last verse for you, and then we'll, I want to say a prayer, and then we'll worship together. Revelation 3.20. Jesus says this, Behold. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus says, Behold, I. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He still likes to have dinner at people's houses. He still wants to come close and hang out with you. He doesn't want it to be the high, high thing. He wants to come and have, this is actually iced tea, and he'd like to have a little. I'm just saying. He's there. Behold, I am here knocking. Let me into your life. I want to be a part of your life. And by the perspective of the cross, I want to make your life make sense now and in the future. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.